I talk about the word entheogen, I throw this word around quite a bit, and I need to break it down. I think entheogen, right? Within theo and generate, something that generates God within you. Now, these are usually plants or near-death experiences. Near-death experiences are very rarely referred to as entheogens. Usually, these things are sacred plants. Mushrooms, ayahuasca, peyote, cannabis, even LSD. Finding God. What if a pill could help you find God faster? Well, a controversial medical study claims an illegal hallucinogenic drug could do just that. But it's setting off a controversy in the medical community. Joining us to explain a little bit more about this study is Dr. James E. Smith, professor and chairman of the Physiology and Pharmacology Department at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. Welcome, doctor. Good morning. Well, how is this different than when I was growing up and hearing about Timothy Leary uh, giving LSD and other hallucinogenics? Well, we were growing up at the same time, uh, and it's very different in that this was a very rigorous uh, scientific study in one of the top-notch uh, human behavioral pharmacology laboratories actually in the nation. Well, the, the headline uh, attracted my attention. It says, hallucinogenic in mushrooms creates universal mystical experience. What is a mystical experience? I think a mystical experience is uh, one in which uh, individuals can have in various settings. Uh, it can be highly religious uh, uh, circumstances, but generally it's a circumstance where one feels that one is really uh, communing with something more than themselves. Communing with something more than oneself. St. Paul would call this the Christ Consciousness communing with something more than yourself, within yourself. Paul's letters were very important and anyone taking this topic seriously should investigate them. This communing with something other than yourself, within yourself. When Paul wrote about the Christ in you, this is exactly what he was talking about. Our essential identity the fabric that makes us alive and conscious is divine. Not our identity, not how we appear to each other, but how we appear to ourselves when our ego is dissolved. Paul was one of the earliest Christians. His letters are at the roots of Christianity. Many people don't realize Paul's letters were written before the Gospels. Paul's letters were written before the Gospels. But in the New Testament, it's the other way around. And the Gospel stories come first, and Paul's letters follow. Well, Paul, I mean, is a fascinating character. And in our reading, is the one of the earliest Christians. Now, what's been cleverly done is that even traditional Christian scholars would accept that the Gospels were written you know, the conservative guess is, is, say, 90 AD for the first gospel. Now, that would place the gospels 40 years after Paul's letters. But in the New Testament, it's put the other way around. So you get the gospel stories first and then Paul's letters. When you come to Paul, you automatically think that the Jesus Christ that he's talking about is the Jesus Christ you've just been reading about in the Gospels. And it took scholars quite a few centuries before they went and investigated Paul. What does he actually say about this Jesus figure? And what's amazing is that if you investigate Paul's original letters, his real letters, because there are quite a few forgeries in the New Testament, he makes no historical mention of a Jesus at all. In fact, when he comes to talk about uh, the great secret that's been stored up from the beginning of time that he's going to reveal to his, his listeners. He doesn't say it's that Jesus was born down the road in a shed and he's the son. He says the secret is this, Christ in you. So for Paul, if you read his letters, and I urge anybody to, to read them with an open mind, 
you will construct a cosmic Jesus Christ who never had any existence. You'll, you'll never hear anything about his parents, Mary and Joseph. You'll never hear anything about a virgin birth. You won't hear anything about where he was crucified. Or These are cosmic events. And, and I think the most telling of all is, you know, if you've been around anyone who has had a recently dead guru, even if they haven't met them themselves, as Paul clearly says, he, he, he met a vision of light. Yeah. They, they, you know, oh, he did this, he said that, or, you know, I heard a story Because that's their way of proving their connection it's with the guru. It's all about the quotes from the guru. In Paul, yeah. we have none of this. Yeah. We simply have this figure that you die and resurrect with, and then you discover the Christ within. And that's the message of the Gnostic Christians, who don't believe in an historical Jesus, and... It's also the message of the ancient mysteries, where the same figure was called by different names, but was essentially also someone that you mystically died and resurrected, or come back, came back, you come back to life with or through. Mm. Yeah. Paul, Paul, is, Paul writes in the, in the language of the mysteries and the language of the Gnostics, and he's a, he's a much misunderstood figure. Yeah. And the traditional uh, orthodox view would be, many people call Paul the earliest heretic because they have a vision of uh, Jesus came to bring his message and Paul slightly distorted it and added a lot of Greek mythology and all the rest of it. Actually, if you turn the two around, what happened is that Paul came first with his Gnostic cosmic Christ and then the literalist came along and fashioned a story and perverted Paul's original message. We started talking about symbolism and the significance of symbolism and how symbolism is uh, 10,000 words if a picture is a thousand, right? Sometimes symbolism is blatant. You can see it. It's right there in front of your eyes. Sometimes it's not. And when it comes to mushroom symbolism, you can just kind of let your mind go. You might see a, a crown of thorns Here's a close-up of the thorn itself. Maybe I should just let these pictures roll on for just a minute. The shaman dresses in the colors of their sacred plants, or mushrooms. And when the Christian Inquisition killed all the shaman, they stole their land, they stole their techniques, they stole their plant knowledge, they stole their traditions and their rituals, and they stole their garb. So don't get me started on that. That's for another day. Right now let's talk about the Amanita muscaria and its particular growth cycle. Here in this picture on the left, the mushroom has already been picked, and that's what this hole is, this black hole. It kind of looks like a bird's nest. And the white that you're seeing, those are the white spores. Little tiny, tiny little white spores. Uh, these are the seeds of the mushroom. And these mushrooms are really tough. That's what this white part of the mushroom is a really tough part of the mushroom, and it's hard and white like a stone at this stage as it breaks through the dirt. Uh, my friend Clark has a theory that the dirt will wedge itself inside the little spikes or thorns sticking out of the mushroom and as the mushroom grows it breaks apart the dirt by stretching it apart and cracking it and that allows it to break through some really tough soil. This is a picture of the base of the mushroom, just as either the dirt has been scraped away or just as the mushroom has been picked uh, from including the base, not just cut at the dirt. So I have this slide to show these concentric rings around the mushroom. And these rings around the mushroom are growth spurts. At night when the mushroom grows, you can see where it has grown the night before. and as it shoots up and makes its 
stalk, you can still see the little concentric rings around the stalk of the mushroom. The veil of the mushroom, that kind of looks like a little apron or skirt worn by the mushroom, is what holds the spores. So when this annulus is attached to the red part of the mushroom, all of the spores are contained up inside of it. And as the mushroom stretches and stretches and stretches, it stretches farther away than the annulus can attach itself and it becomes detached and when it becomes detached it falls down here like an apron or a skirt and all of the spores rain down onto the grass below and that starts the cycle again and at this point the mushroom will enter into what is often referred to as a table stage the mushroom cap will continue to turn upwards and at this point it will form a little cup and at night the dew or perhaps uh, a little rain shower, the water will settle into the cup. And when this happens, take particular notice of the ring around the halo, if you will, around the mushroom. And this halo is caused because the water is absorbing all of the red pigment. And if you leave the water in there long enough, the entire mushroom will turn gold kind of a yellow gold and the water will be blood red so you could take this mushroom and you could eat you could take and eat or you could take and drink and there are holy grail legends that you can go on yourself from here now the legend of this mushroom is many thousands of years old, but it's not the only psychoactive substance to make its way into today's traditions and today's legends. <laughs>